All right, another show, Crooked Spine Show. I'm Dr. Tony, the host of Crooked Spine Show. I'm here in Upland, California. Dina Freeman is in South Carolina. We're going to talk about why does experience matter when you when you look for help, especially medical help. Okay, Miss Dina has been a nurse for about uh, 20 years. She's helped a lot of people can empathize what they're going through. And we're going to talk about our topics today. Will be about postpartum, about uh, uh, being uh, menopause and perimenopause, also insomnia, how that works. And what's the mindset to recovery and things like we're going to even add more topics as we go. We want to see exactly, especially women with over 40, how can we get help for myself, my wife, women in my lives, along with our audience here too, that they have that help from their medical doctor. They've been told everything's are okay. It might even be a psychological problem for one too. No, talk to Dina. She's going to explain her experience here and how, what she's done with her clients in the past to help you understand how you get help outside of your healthcare professional that we pay insurance for, right? So, you know, to take it away, how do you get into this? So, I've been a nurse. I've been in healthcare for over 20 years. I've been a nurse practitioner for probably the last seven years, and I've been into functional medicine about five. How I went from traditional medicine to functional medicine, I decided to have a baby at 42. So, right. thank right. you. So he's four now, but that changed my mindset about mm -hmm. how women perimenopausal, menopausal women, just how to take them seriously. Symptoms are real. They should not be dismissed. I think that as women, we have been not dismissed, but we're wives, we're moms. It's kind of, we've kind of begun to normalize the anxiety, the, the mental issue, the mental health, the fatigue. We just normalize it all because we are kind of, well, you're a wife, you're a mom. You just had a baby. You're going to be tired. So we've learned to normalize that when that's not okay. That's when really you say not normalized. Okay. Does that mean it's like it's almost like if that's the average, I'm within the average, correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So you know, just having a baby, a baby at 42. Yes, our hormones. So my hormones are already probably going a little crazy, and I just tailspun them just by deciding to do that. So, but it made me really look at my female patients and their symptoms as real and try not to put a bandaid over him. We try, I try to start addressing them. And then even after having a baby, he had like some just minor skin issues that just kind of sent me down the functional medicine mm -hmm. hole of looking for root cause versus just slapping a steroid cream on it. Got it. And what, and why do you think, why do we treat our babies, our kids, especially infants? We want to think we're more specific about doing more natural versus ourselves, if you want to call it that. Why is that? Why is that more common in, in in newborns or parents wanting it for their newborns? So I think the difference in the two is for me, I need to feel better now. I don't Got now. It. So it's that instant gratification of sometimes if you could give me a pill to make my anxiety go away or to give me some energy today, then mm -hmm. let's just slap a Band-Aid on it and fix it today so that I can be optimal to help my baby find the root cause of his issues. When in reality, we should be finding the root cause of all of it. Good. So it's almost like going, okay, why don't we treat ourselves as well as we do other people around us, even our pets? We, we spend so much money on our pets every year, take our, take our own health as serious. So we can, yes, yes, we can worry about our baby today, our, our needs today, but also long-term, how do we want to live our life? What's your quality of life want to be, correct? Correct. Correct. Good, good, good. I think as moms, though, we put ourselves on the back burner because we're trying to fix everything else first. Yes. I, I, and that's why in the two professions that I I, if you want to call it a door as nurses and moms, because they're basically thrown to everything. Hey, take care of the mess and we'll be back later. I don't Correct. know what's going to happen. <laughs> Correct. And later very rarely comes for most of us. Well, later is like later in life, not even yes. this year. Later Absolutely. In life. Absolutely. Absolutely. And getting to topics too, I saw a lot of your reviews. What is postpartum and how do you help your clients with postpartum? So postpartum part of mamas are my favorite um, because they you're trying to take care of yourself. You're trying to take care of this new baby. You're trying to shut off all the advice and all the things. I mean, even if it's not your first baby, it's still a new mm -hmm. baby. Everything mm -hmm. at home changes. So it's just making sure that they take care of themselves, trying to encourage that they take care of themselves first, set boundaries with other people. Just I, they're just my favorite just because their hormones are just all over the place and they're trying to figure out this whole new life. <laughs> it's almost like it's especially I want to say the first because I have patients come in and go, they had a new baby, maybe the, the wife or the husband. You we have as a parent of four, 
I have no idea if if the kid, the new child is going to be sleep through the night, not sleep the night, be colicky. This, it's, you have no idea until you have that child in front of you and you have to react to it. And then how do your, how does your body physically and mentally deal with that stressor every day? Right. That's right. So I had, so I, there's a huge, there's a 17 year age gap between my baby and my baby. I have two older children and then this one. And I was not in healthcare at the time. I was in healthcare with the little one. And that was a double edged sword because being okay. in healthcare, knowledge is power and sometimes ignorance is bliss. Mm, so yes. for it's sure. almost like you feel more naive. You, you trust someone else to do it versus, hey, look, I've heard this before. You start asking questions to your doctor, like, that doesn't seem right. I mean, what right. about this? You start asking more questions. They go to a rabbit hole where now you That's, have more yes. to do. Absolutely. Wow. And with postpartum, what level of stress goes from normal stress to postpartum condition? How would someone how would someone feel that or know? Hey, look, maybe I'm there now versus I'm just being stressed. So it's you have to you have to be cognizant of your own stress level really before the baby comes to kind of know where you can handle it versus where you need to get help. You know, I've had some and most people that have come to me have been at that very end of I've tried to handle it myself, but now I'm way I've gone way down the rabbit hole and I'm far, you know, but then you've got to make sure, too, that those postpartum mamas that it doesn't turn into postpartum psychosis. You got to make sure that they're safe, baby safe, all of that. But most of the people that reach out to me, you know, I encourage my pregnant mamas. You know, I worked in primary care forever. Um, I still work in primary care, but so I encourage my pregnant mamas to reach out, not just follow up with their OB after the baby comes to, but make sure they follow up with their primary care provider as well, because we may see things a little differently than the OB. So I try to encourage them to just be cognizant of where they are before baby comes and then after baby comes and not to wait until the stress is just completely out of control. A lot of it is to, would someone like yourself then ask also the husband, hey, has your wife acted differently? Is she... Does she look like she's more anxious? Is she more depressed sometimes? Has she done things that are not her normal routine? Exactly. Exactly. We try to, I try to make sure I ask family members to make sure that other people are aware of what's going on. And just to make sure that my postpartum mamas know that it's okay to ask for help. It is okay. Just because you already have three babies at home and you should be a pro at this does not mean you're going to be. And what type of signs would you feel, say medical signs that you would feel or, or look for in someone that's postpartum? Um, As far as anxiety, I would say just, you know, I know for me after after having a baby at 42, my anxiety was through the roof. I wouldn't leave the house with him by myself. Mm. I wouldn't. I mean, we live in such a different world now, but I wouldn't leave the house with him by myself. Um, I I had a really hard time asking for help. I kind of just was hovering like so there's just a lot of different things to look for because everybody is so different. Mm. But just the racing heart rate, you know. Anxiety can present as physical symptoms as well. So if, you know, the anxiety, the racing heart, the sweating, the just so many different things to look for. And part of that, too, is you talk about it, would it be a diet change also in some people that get more postpartum? I, I try to encourage my postpartum mamas to make sure that they're eating healthy, making sure that they're drinking the water because that plays a part in how you feel overall anyway. So mm-hmm. definitely when your hormones are going crazy and you're you're trying to just kind of get your body back on track, the nutrition plays a huge part in that. And and going to that too, do you also recommend them doing some type of form of exercise or is that something like, well, I just don't have the time? I encourage it, yes, because as we know, exercise makes us always feel better. So even if you put the baby in a stroller, go outside and get get some sunshine, Mm -hmm. um, as soon as you're clear from your doctor, I highly encourage just taking walks, even if it's just very light exercise. Is there any type of supplements you would recommend for someone that is postpartum? Depending on whether or not they're breastfeeding, obviously, but magnesium and then B-complex vitamins and vitamin D, definitely vitamin D. Good, good. It almost seems like... How do we calm the body down? Is is postpartum a, if you want to call it a direct link to anxiety? Is it basically an anxiety form after or after birth or is there something more complex to that? I think anxiety definitely comes after childbirth. Um, I think just the anxiety of just every, you know, taking the baby home. I don't think the anxiety really sits in until you go home because you've got all these people helping you in the hospital and then you're home with this <laughs> new baby and have no idea what to do. But I think, I think some form of anxiety just comes with bringing the baby home. I mean, it's just a whole new experience, but then that anxiety also can kind of spiral out of control very quickly. Yes. Yeah, so that's what I, that's what I worry about is with my patients for one, two being a chiropractor, 
a lot of it is when there's having chronic pain, has it caused some form of, I, I always level it up. I go is, do you feel more stressed? Yes. Do you feel anxious sometimes? Yes. Has it led to depression? Yes. Okay. Let's figure out what's going on here. That exactly. point is, it's the body's effect of the body changing its hormones and say, and it, I, I would explain to my patients more of a stress state. So now you're stuck here. How do we help you get out of here? Maybe hopefully naturally, but if not, even going medically if need be, so you get out as soon as you can, because it takes time, right? Right. What's the time frame to help someone to get out of postpartum when they're in that state? I know it varies probably. But I was going to say, it definitely varies. I think yeah. if it's an acute anxiety, like if it is acute anxiety, I mean, you may it may require medication to kind of get them leveled out while we work on getting them to, you know, getting the root cause. Sometimes I think postpartum is the root cause. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're told as women, oh, you got to give your body a year to get back normal. Well, then your baby's a year old and you just miss the whole year. Uh -huh. So I think that it's just, you know, I think postpartum can contribute to being part of the root cause. But at the mm -hmm. same time, I think that if the nutrition is balanced and the water is there and the light exercise is there and we're doing all of those things that we should be doing anyway, I think that that will decrease the postpartum episodes of anxiety. When we all know we're going to have stressful days, right? We're going to have days our baby doesn't want to sleep at all. We don't feel good. Something else happens in our life for one, too. But we're talking about someone that is dealing with it daily. doesn't matter what the stressors are. Their their mindset is in that, we call it psychosis, that level of, of stress all the time, correct? Yeah, correct. Okay. How much does insomnia have to play into postpartum or is that something different? I think it plays a part. I think postpartum mamas need their rest, but I think insomnia is something that so many women, so many people in general, but you know, my focus is women struggle with. Um, well, what, how do you I don't want to call it diagnosed as insomnia? What's a good definition of I haven't slept in three or four days. I, I don't sleep when I have this stress. Or how would you, how would you define or give it a, give well, it I typically, a I typically try to ask my patients, do you have trouble falling asleep? Do you have trouble staying asleep? I think both of those contribute to anxiety, but I try to teach good sleep hygiene for mm -hmm. my patients and just making sure, I mean, I think our cell phones are probably our worst enemies when it comes to, yeah. when it comes to sleep hygiene, but it's just mindset changes and breaking those bad habits. And, and what's the, what's the cause of the cell phone? I even call it the iPad. So people are like, I love to read. Or any of the TV, iPad. all of it. All yeah, of it. all of it. And, all and of it. What, I, what someone told me before is that it, what, what cell phones see, especially on social media, it lowers your, your um, uh, what's it called? We eat turkey day every day, serotonin level every day. So that when your serotonin level is lower, so your body can't relax. Absolutely. And it also decreases melatonin production. So your body can't mm -hmm. fall asleep. So but you're, if you're scrolling social media, for sure, then your mind can never shut off. I mean, we're never giving our minds time to just stop. But even t like you said, even TV also, I love to watch a show. The problem is, even if it's a B movie, I'll still watch hoping it get better. That's my hope. But the mm -hmm. problem is, sometimes it won't. But I watch the end and also I go to bed. I'm like, oh, that was, well, was wasting my hour and a half. Now exactly. It's kind of Correct. It's about 930. It's 1030, 11. I'm like, great. Dude, I just lost an hour and a half. That's correct. So how do you help someone break that habit? What do you normally do? So what I basically teach is, one, I have always learned in school, bedrooms are for sleep and sex. Don't put mm -hmm. a TV in your bedroom. Nice. That's what I've always been told. But 99% of the population has a TV in their bedroom. Um, I it's personally okay. sleep. America. We need TVs in our bedroom, right? I sleep better on. if my TV never comes on. But that never happens. That never happens. I do try to cut it off before I go to bed. Um <laughs> So I try to encourage no electronics about an hour before, no TV, no, you know, if you want to read in bed, you know, I've learned stay in the living room, leave the lights on, read when you get sleepy, go get in the bed. But we all, no one does that. We read till we get sleepy. So is it reading a book different than reading an iPad? Correct. Absolutely. Good. Because you don't have that light. Yeah. A hundred percent. You should be reading a book, not an iPad. I'm going to have my watch, my wife watch this right now. I think I'm going to yes. call right now. Because she loves reading bed in her iPad, I want to go to bed, but I have to yes. go outside and sleep outside. Because she, that's just my that's my personal. Yes. Opinion. So when you're awake, you should be up, be in the living room. I mean, you can dim your living room lights, but when you get sleepy, that's when you go to bed. So I encourage mm -hmm. my patients: if you get in the bed and you can't fall asleep within twenty to thirty minutes, get up. Just get up, go watch TV in the living room, go do something else, go to bed when you're sleepy. Um, cut those electronics off. Um, try to go to bed at the same time every night because you can retrain your body 
to know when it's time to go to bed. You can retrain your brain to know, okay, it's time to go to sleep now. Is that cardiac rhythm or what is that? What's that called? Circadian rhythm? Circadian rhythm. Circadian rhythm. Mm-hmm. rhythm. That's what I was saying. Circadian cardiac. rhythm. Yep. So teach but your body, you know, exer- don't exercise right before you go to bed. Um, no heavy meals right before you go to bed. I was saying, how, how does food take important uh, food and in, in, in sleeping? Your body is too busy digesting the food you just ate. It doesn't mm-hmm. even doesn't even care if you go to sleep or not. If you just put all this food in your stomach that it has to work really hard all night to digest now. But you want to go to sleep, so you're not going to go to sleep. And if you do lay down, you're likely going to have heartburn and mm-hmm. everything else that goes along with that. So the food coma isn't really a good thing to do. Okay, no, no. <laughs> how about, I was going to say too, what, what are different levels of sleep? What are different levels of sleep people have? I, I've heard, I, I know. What are, how would you explain different levels of sleep to people? As far as like your stages and your REM, your REM sleep. Mm-hmm. So when you, you want to get into that REM sleep, for sure, that's when you have your best sleep. But if your body is digesting food, if your brain is still processing all the negative things that you just saw on TV, on social media, you just aren't going to get into that good REM sleep. And you're going to feel that when you wake up in the morning, you might have slept eight hours, but you're going to feel exhausted because you did not get that good quality sleep that you needed. When you say REM sleep, how should someone feel in the morning when they get the REM sleep? Refreshed, like they got some really good sleep. I tell people it's almost like you feel like you're re- you, you you charged your whole battery last night. And when you're under Absolutely. stress, maybe physical me- metabolic stress by digestion or psychological stress too, your body stays in an alpha sleep where you're more light sleep. You never get that rest. Or if your body's just stressed in general, you wake up tired, exhausted, like you never slept at all. That's right. That's right. And I really try to teach good sleep habits to my patients and my clients just because that's I mean, that can affect so much. You're not getting enough sleep. And that's your whole next day's ruling. It's just a constant hamster wheel of being tired and trying to get enough sleep. And then if you take something to help you sleep, you really didn't fix the problem. Oh, more Band-Aids. Is there yes. any supplements that are, that are good to help you at least short term to help sleep? Any supplements? Yep. Um, melatonin. Okay. So, but melat- people take melatonin wrong. Um, mm-hmm. I personally think, you know, the bottle Google says five to 10 milligrams before bed. Well, five to 10 milligrams before bed is going to make you go to sleep, but it's not going to reset your cur- circadian rhythm. So you put a bandaid on it, you're going to get good sleep, but you're not fixing the problem. So I encourage patients to take a, one and a half to three milligrams of melatonin after supper. It causes your body to just kind of start winding down, getting ready for just, you know, just winding down for the night. That way, when you go to bed, it might you might not knock out five minutes after you get in bed the first time. But if you do it long enough, your body is going to reset its sleep wake cycle. And when, when you say enough, how often or how many days does it take for an average person? I would probably say, I mean, I, you need to probably try it for 10 days. I mean, a little less, a little longer, but at least 10 days for it to work. It's almost like someone does one day, like it didn't work one day. So forget it, it's not going to work. No, oh, 100%. No. Yeah, but you have to do all the things. You can't take yeah. the melatonin after supper and then go get on your iPad for two hours in bed because you've completely negated taking the melatonin after supper. What's amazing how adults are sometimes worse patients than kids because oh. they, they think they know too much. They, well, I, I have to get this work done. It's to do tomorrow. I'm like, why do you do it earlier? Well, I was busy watching my show that I want to watch every week. Yes. No, record it. Yes. Whatever you do. Yep. Mindset. It's all about mindset. We make time for the things that we want to do. Yes. And let's go, let's go right to mindset, too, since you brought it up already, too. How does mindset help our recovery post, postpartum, insomnia, everything we're going to talk about? We have more topics, too. Let's go right there. How does mindset work for your patients? So for me, and what I teach, mindset is everything. I think for, you know, specifically for women, because that's what I, that's my passion, mm-hmm. is you know, let's take weight loss. You have to retrain your brain and unlearn everything you have ever learned about dieting if you really want to make sustainable lifestyle changes when it comes to weight loss and nutrition, because it's not about a fad diet. It's not about a six week program or a 30 day program. I mean, you have to make those changes. And then if you eat a cookie, eat a cookie, but don't beat yourself up because you ate a cookie. Just don't eat 42 cookies. So it's it's a oh, it's a mindset thing. And that's only forty one more. Come on, right? Man. Women the get women get in their mind women. though, especially I'm sure men do it too. But I can only speak for women. Get in their mind that okay, this is a six week program, so I got to do all these things in six weeks, and then I'm good. Or I got a I was notorious for I ate a cookie today. I ain't wasting thirty minutes exercise, and I'll just start again tomorrow. I'll just eat bad the rest of the day. So it's just you have to give yourself grace when you 
I mean, this is life. There's going to be birthday parties and weddings and don't don't avoid the things that you love. You just got to it's balance. You have to learn how to balance. Well, the problem is they don't sell cookies one at a time. They sell them like a 12 dozen box. Well, it's true. But they true. go bad like in one day, I think. That's I don't know. true. That's true. Well, what you're getting to it too is you want to be a little uncomfortable, I think, when you're doing anything different to change when you're I mean, my tone patients, the mindset is I'm being a little uncomfortable, but that's good for me. And I'm going to make sure my day to day does not affect me tomorrow. I'm going to make sure every day I close out my day and start tomorrow a different day. Agreed. Agreed. Why, and why, do we, why, do we, why do we beat ourselves up on that? Because it's just it's the way society taught us to be. I think it's just the way the world has taught us to be. And we, when you really want to make changes, regardless in your life, no matter what area it's in, one, you have to stop looking at what society says you should be. Do more, be more, move faster, go faster. You have to just cut all of that out. And you just have to retrain your brain. And, you know, you just have to retrain your brain to do things the way that you're trying to, for the goals that you're trying to accomplish. Instant gratification, worst thing ever. Well, I think a lot of it is we have to think of outside the box and and not be the average. That's right. We be ourselves, which can be, and I'm going to say for everyone, you're going to be above average for your health in the sense where most people will run the doctor for everything. Will not listen. They, 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 I have McDonald's about two doors down. There's a line out the door every day. That's right. They, they don't really, either they don't care or they're naive in the sense where they don't know, but they're looking for, looking for an option for one, two. So That's a lot right. of them yeah. have a mindset of, of the change. Okay. I want to stick to this. I'm going to use Dina to help me be accountable. So make sure I stay on track. Even when I have bad days, I can still recover from those bad days. That's right. That's right. And people think that if they eat McDonald's today and then three days from now and then five days from now, well, it's just one McDonald's. They don't realize that those little changes over time are going to add up to big results in six months or a year down the road. It's simple math, my friends. It is. Come it on. is. Come on. It is. I and if you're not uncomfortable, you're not doing it right. Regardless Good. of what it is. If you're not right. uncomfortable, you're not doing it right. Good. If someone says, hey, you're... How are you feeling? Eh, not good. Fantastic. Exactly. When you're causing the change. Exactly. I mean, we all understand. We understand the body is homeostatic, right? It wants to maintain balance. When we throw something off on it, maybe maybe changing how we eat, how we sleep, um, our overall lifestyle. It is a good stressor to get to a healthier state, but it may take you three, four, five weeks to get that to feel a healthier state as your normal state. Right. It all comes down to. Going on to our, our last, uh, kind of a last topic, what is menopause, perimenopause, and how does that help, help women understand over 40, I'm assuming, to understand how to get recovery from that or get back to better quality of life? So women obviously start their menstrual cycles at a very young age. We end them at an older age. Once, mm -hmm. you know, when we're 12, 13, 15, however old we are, it's okay, this is a part of life. This is what's going to happen. Okay, that's, not, I mean, there's things that you can do for abdominal cramps and those kinds of things. But then when we get older, we're told you started your cycle. Now it's time to end your cycle. So all these symptoms you're having, you're just going to have to deal with them. It's just part of life. Well, that's not really the case. Uh -oh. Definitely not the case. I mean, you could have too much estrogen. You could have not enough progesterone. I mean, there's a lot of different things that could go with. You don't just have to suffer through the symptoms, I guess is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it is a natural part of life. But there's a whole lot of stuff that comes along with us that comes along with that that keeps women from living their best quality of life and you know they're tired and they're hot flashing and they're all these things and there is you know you can get to the root cause of that the root cause might be menopause but there are natural ways to kind of combat that stuff well I think a lot of it is we talk about menopause but I've, I've talked to other experts about too is a lot of it is it's a hormone cha hormonal change in your body your body's trying to adjust to and it may be normal, but let's check everything out and see if it is or not. First being right. told, like you had said, hey, it's just part of your life. I'm like, I, whenever a doctor says, I'm like, just slap your doctor at that right. point. Right. Because normal is not optimal. Normal for you normal. is not normal for me. So your optimal may not be my optimal. You know, and it all goes back to gut health and nutrition as well. You know, your uh, estrogen is metabolized by your liver. It's distributed out throughout your body by your gut. So if you've got too much estrogen in your body, well, you're going to have all these crazy symptoms. So, yes, we should check your hormones to figure out what your levels are, not just I'm not going to check your hormones. It's just menopause. There's nothing we can do about it. And is it funny? Is it if you want to call it going through health care, 
do most doctors say your head you're probably going to menopause let's go check your hormones right now see what's going on or is it something where you have to really force them to do that I don't think any, I, I'm not, I can't say any, I can speak for me in the sure. traditional medicine world. I do try to check hormones. Um, I do have people tell me, I've had clients in the functional medicine realm tell me my doctor won't check my hormones. If you draw a lab and your lab is abnormal, you have to fix it. You have to do something about it. You can't just let an abnormal lab linger over here with not doing anything about it. And unless you're gynecology, OBGYN, you don't know much about hormones. I mean, there's mm -hmm. so... When you go to your primary, they're not going to go, well, you got to go see an OB joint and go see it. Like, they go, ah, eh, you're probably just this. When you say, I mean, anytime a doctor says, you're probably just probably normal, I always think in my head, they're just saying, I don't know without saying, I don't know. Correct. I agree. And it's amazing where, why not get someone the help they need, especially if they're not feeling well, not feeling like themselves, versus saying, ah, eh, you'll be okay. Because you, right. what I recommend, what I always say is, would they say that to their mom, their aunt, someone exactly. they love? Exactly. Exactly. So I can honestly say having a baby at 42 has opened my eyes to, you know, I'm 45 now, so he's four. So it's just opened my eyes to perimenopausal women and, and kind of what they go through at menopause. And so I just, I treat that very differently now. What I like is that you can empathize with them and what they've Absolutely. gone through. And now wrote, basically you understand their steps or whatever they're in when they contact you, how to get to the better step and better step and better step. Correct. And what's the step you usually walk walk them through? How does that step process work? So we typically, if a woman comes in and she's very, um, or if I, let's just say I have a client, let's talk about the functional medicine realm. Um, okay. So if I have a client, the first thing we do is we're going to check those hormones and we're going to kind of see what her levels are. Absolutely. And then we're going to kind of, we're going to work on nutrition. We're going to work on mm -hmm. all of the things that need to be worked on for hormonal balance, exercise, strength training. Um, there's just so many things that can that can help you rebalance your hormone without even taking an estrogen or a pill or anything like that. So it's really just changing mindset, changing lifestyle, but making sure that they connect the dots and know what's going on. Like a lot of women, believe it or not, don't know. I mean, you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they don't know things that they don't know. You just and you have to break it down. I mean, there is so much overwhelming information when you open up your computer about nutrition and lifestyle and postpartum and anxiety that they finally say, forget it and shut their computer. But, and they just keep on going. Mm -hmm. I had a client tell me today she knew she had heard all these things about all this nutritional stuff, but had no idea where to start because you read this and it tells you to do this. And you go over here and it says, nope, don't do that. Do this. It's so it's just there's just so much information out there. Information overload causes a lot of women to just shut down and just keep on going. Well, men and men, same thing, too. Men are men are a little bit Neanderthal sometimes. They don't, they don't even know the laptop. They don't know how to work it. A right. lot of kids, when they do, OK, I hear this from my buddy here. My buddy Johnny does over here. Problem is Johnny is not you. And, and, and Sally is not Mary. What helped your mom may not help you at this time. That's right. So understanding where they are and their help. Talking to you, Dina allows them to go how do i help me by understanding how he's going to help me walk through the process figure out what's working what's not working and how do we get that body to change over time that's right and time frame changing hormones what's the time frame for someone again average to get their hormone levels to change where they feel normal again honestly i don't think it takes a very long time i mean you no. can change hormones within a matter of weeks if someone's low in progesterone and they truly need a progesterone supplement and you start it they mm -hmm. notice changes almost immediately Mm -hmm. So it's just I, I don't think hormonal changes take very long to fix. It's just women. A lot of women, when they start, when you start talking to them about nutrition and exercise and this is what you need to help rebalance your hormones. Well, they also want to lose 30 pounds and that didn't happen in four days. So it must not be working for them. So it just it all honestly, it all goes back to mindset, mindset, yeah. mindset, mindset. Good. And when someone goes on supplements for progesterone and for other hormones, too, do you, if someone stays on long, because I don't know, does that your body then recalibrates where it no longer needs to produce it itself or something to where it changes? I think your body recalibrates. I mean, you, if you ever do hormone, like hormone replacement therapy mm -hmm. of any kind, obviously it should be bioidentical hormones, which is as close to your body, what your body makes that can possibly be made outside of your body. And it's the least amount of hormone for the least amount of time. And that's based on symptoms. So you do a symptom assessment with your client. I do a symptom assessment with my clients in the beginning. And then we may do another symptom assessment in a couple of weeks. But we're not going to keep checking labs. If your symptoms are improving, then your 
you know, you have changes happening. You know, at that point, do you recommend them on their own to start lowering their, their hormone uh, supplements? Yep, I do. And we, and we assess symptoms based on that. Good. So you're allowing them to get a reassessment continuously as their symptoms change, as their body improves, correct? Absolutely. It's, it's not that hard to do, but when someone, it's like I said, they don't know, That's right. they'll make put on progesterone for a, a, a high level, and also their body has other reactions. Now they're taking medications for now insomnia or something else going on. So now they have a pile of stuff they're taking versus looking at the main cause. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And getting to the root cause to me, mm-hmm. I definitely I'm in healthcare, so I try to break it down for patients that are in healthcare, but it's really not that hard. It's very simple steps. It's just changing your mindset to know that these steps are going to take time. Wherever you are, you didn't get here overnight. You're not going to fix it overnight. Well, and having having you, Dina, as a coach, what is the compliance rate success rate of someone who has a coach or someone doing it on their own? So for my one-on-one clients, I think the success rate has been very high. I've had patients who have lost the weight, but it's not so much the physical transformations that I hear praise about. It's just the mental transformations, and it's just the transforming their lives from inside out and just feeling so much better. I think weight loss is just an added bonus when you start digging to the root cause and trying to change your habits. Well, and especially long-term, correct? That's all it comes down to. When you change your habits, then you'll see your physical body change too. Correct. If someone that doesn't have a coach, what's the average success rate of doing it on their own? I can't really give you a percentage, but I would say almost non-existent because the results aren't going to happen almost immediately and they're going to give up. I think the accountability factor plays a huge role. Huge. When you when you work on someone one on one, what's your time frame working them per week? Is a couple hours per week? You call them here and there, text message here and there. Well, how do you usually work with your clients? So typically, it's um, I have a four month program, and we have one on one visits every other week. So it's like twice a month for an hour, but mm-hmm. then they have access to me in between those appointments. So You're like a concierge clinician for them all the time. It is exactly. That's a lot of work, Deanna. What are you going to do with all your free? With you have no free time then. It's okay. It's just, I, it's my passion and I'm just, it's, it's just what I want to do for these women. I, I feel at 46, I probably feel better than I ever felt in even my thirties, my late twenties, early thirties. Um, and everybody should have, I mean, I just want everybody to feel good. Isn't it amazing when you have that passion to help other people It actually gives you more energy. You're like, okay, I helped someone today. Boom. What, who's exactly. Next? Who's next? exactly. And if you're doing what you love, it never feels like work. It really doesn't ever feel like work. No, no, no. No. Anything else I had missed that you want to talk about on the show that you help your clients with? Nope. I think that's it. I think we covered everything. I think so. I don't look at notes. I don't know what the notes are. Well, what I like about you, you sent me the links too, is your better sleep guide from when I put on the show notes already too. Your your um your website is Deanna is the it's it's pronounced Deanna Freeman Wellness, even though your name is Dina. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure you understand that on there too. Understand she's going to help you because she can empathize wherever you are in life, especially if you've had a baby at that point. How do I get my, how do I know where I am? That's, that's step one, right? Am I, is this normal right. for me? That's is right. It's normal to where I am. If it's not, how do we get to a better state? She'll help you walk you through that. Exactly. All right. Anything else you want to add? Nope. I think that's it. I think we covered it all. Good. I do. I have all my, all my interviewees do quick, quick screenshot, free shot for one to just wave real quick. Okay. Wave, wave, wave. Good. And we're done. Any, anything else? Again, I'm going to have the show notes all the way up there. I'm going to send you all the videos. Hold on for one second. We take you off the show. At that point, guys, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Right here. And then close. And come on, people. Can you put my over here? And then there we go.